Thank you, Pauline, for moderating so beautifully. Um, I just know, I think, talk, talk about vibrating in our chairs with excitement. I think Kathy and Roberta and I, and Elise too, you're gonna meet Elise and this afternoon, are vibrating with excitement because it is, right? We're so psyched to see these incredible ideas um, come forward. So we have a, about 10 minutes now to take some questions. We're gonna take them from both the online audience and our lovely in-person audience. It's really exciting to see this many people in this room. Um, I just, I'm gonna note that right now. Two years ago, it was the very, it was 2022 when we did this and COVID was still very much, I mean, it is still today, I recognize, but even then much more a concern and we had to really limit our ability to commune as people. And it's so lovely to have everyone here. So I just wanted to say that and how important that is for us just being able to kind of get, get um, this kind of cross-sector collaboration going. So what I'm gonna do is take a couple of questions. I have my colleague Elena in the back with the microphone. We'll take maybe one from the room now and then I'm gonna have one from online. Katie, there are a few hope that have come in online. So um, wonderful, thank you so much for that. Before we take that question, there's one more thing I just remembered. I do want to um, make sure that everyone online, as well as you guys here in the room, know that there is an online bulletin board and it, it's open for all um, that is associated with this event. And there's a QR code on, that, on the agenda postcard that you received. And I think I might be able to actually put it up on screen here too. Um, let me just back it up, yes. So, during the conversations um, it, that, are, that are to come or anything that's come to you and to your mind today as we're having this Q&A, feel free to jump into that online bulletin board and put in a link, reference a new event that's coming up, um, anything that you think your, your colleagues and all of us kind of participating in the space would like to know because um, we want to make sure we're sharing out. So um, I'll keep that up here while we're doing some, some Q&A. And let's see, so is anybody in the room have a question? So here in the front, yes. And when you say your question, you can just give us your name um, and affiliation just really quickly and then just quickly get to the question. My name is Mark Nadell, no affiliation. Um, just curious how receptive teachers colleges and organizations that provide professional development are to the ideas that you guys are generating. Ah, I love the, that we're already going to the question of like how to um, recognize our teacher preparation programs in this. I'm gonna actually ensure that maybe Kathy and Roberta can also answer some of this for us um, so we can pass the mic to them. But I'll just quickly say that uh, we, at the education policy program here at New America, we have several analysts who work on issues of teacher preparation, educator quality, um, retention, recruitment, and we are actively trying to kind of cross-populate a lot of these different ideas and programs there. But I do think that's a next step for this kind of work. Um, and, and some of the folks who've been part of the, the panels may also want to answer. Um, John, in particular, who's in that world, um, may want to. But Kathy, do you want to provide a, a take on it, too? Yeah. I think so. I'll just chime in quickly to say what we've noticed, um, not so much with these three projects, which are not really out in the world yet. They're out in the world as of today. As yes. We have presented them, and thank you to the brilliant groups who did them. Um, but in other projects where Roberta and I have been focusing on joy and playful learning and active playful learning, what we find is that the schools that teach teachers are often somewhat receptive to trying to bring it into the curricula. But then what you find is that the teachers, young teachers go into school systems and they're barraged with these barricades that prevent them from using what they were taught. So I think what we need to do is both get this science of learning populated into the education of teachers around the world. And then the next thing we really have to do is think about what school in the 21st century could really look like and turn it back over to educators and the amazing teachers in the world and maybe away from the business model and over to the educator model. Yeah, and actually, um, does anyone else in the, among the fellows cohorts wanna take that or have any response to that? Yes, John, please. Um, so great question. Uh, I think the short answer is very. Um, there's 
we certainly felt like we were pushing against an open door with lots of teacher colleges, um, uh, both in, in the UK and, and the States. It, it varies by culture, uh, of course. Um, that, uh, and Juana spoke um, powerfully about how it, it may be that in some countries it's a, it's a heavier lift. But our sense is that over the last couple of decades, there's, this is the learning sciences exchange. Over the last couple of decades, there's been a lot of effort on understanding one of the science of learning uh, around cognition and instruction and, and, and curriculum. That's really important, and we're glad that that work's been done. But there hasn't been a commensurate focus on the science of the sorts of things that the panelists have spoken about today. And we think that the teachers are hungry for that. Um, they go into, into classrooms, as, as Kathy was saying, and they want to do that work. Uh, and so I think both teacher colleges, but also uh, uh, PD providers uh, and, and schools um, uh, are very interested at building both this understanding and the development programs that allow teachers to do this work in the classrooms. Thank you so much. Let's take a, um, oh, Roberta, you want to jump in and then we'll take a question online. Sure, sure. I just wanted to say, picture a giant ocean liner. Picture the ocean liner trying to turn. <laughs> this, my friends, is education. Yes. And I think it will take all of us in this room and everyone online to bring these ideas out. Now, why should we do this? We have a mental health crisis in the United States among our children following on the heels of COVID, although it was there before. COVID simply exacerbated it. Now, notice that uh, two out of three of these projects dealt with not just the science of learning as taking in information, but with joy and belonging and Boy, is that needed now. And that's why UNESCO is pushing for happy schools. That's why we will be able to reduce absenteeism if we can turn our attention now, not only to the information that students get, but to their feelings, because we've ignored them too long. Okay, Katie, our amazing communications manager, is going to read out one of the questions that's come in online. Yeah, this is one that's going to go for all the LSX fellows, so, so get ready for anyone who wants to answer it. Um, it's from an anonymous participant online. Uh, may we ask the panelists about the norms they established as a group for, for equity of voice in the work across the team while working together and disagreeing? Okay, so I'll say it back again while we're in... The Please, any one of you jump in, it might want to answer, but any kind of norms you guys established as teams for kind of equity of voice? And yes, Margie, start first. So thank you for that question. Um, it's very appropriate. Um, we, we did struggle, I can, I can say that um, on behalf of, of our team. Um, but I think that we, we acknowledged the struggle, which was one thing, so we were conscious and aware. Um, and we, we took time out occasionally to really look at the process of what we were doing as opposed to just the product of what we were doing. And at one point we even came up with, and I'm not sure how much we, how good we were in embedding this, but we tried to really focus on some key issues that we should try to remember when we were working together in order to bring in the notion um, or the value of um, equity and diversity and inclusion. And um, the first was to trust each other. And so we really, really wanted to try and build an environment of trust and particularly to trust our expertise, which linked very much to the second one, which was respect. And that was to, if someone was really good at research, or whatever, then that was that person's domain, even though actually all our circles all interlink with each other. We all have done a bit of everything that because we're leaders, we have, but there was somebody there specifically good at this thing. And so just let that person do that thing. Um, the, the, um, the other one was appreciation, was to try and find as many moments to appreciate each other as possible. So we just really br brought that sense of love and appreciation into our space. Um, the, the other one was um, around clarity, and it has to do with this notion of language, Roberta, that you often talk about. And that is, I think we missed each other a lot in our talking because we made assumptions around what we thought we were trying to say and that someone else was receiving differently. And in the enthusiasm of getting our, you know, our vision ap across, yeah. we missed the, the communication and the ability, I think, a number of times. 
Um, and so the, the whole notion of clarity was something we, um, we really wanted. In. And the last thing I think was we really wanted to try, if we're trying to bring kindness and joy and love into our learning spaces, then we needed to try and bring that into our learning space as well. And so the last one was sort of kindness, to just really stop and be kind to each other. And, and um, so that, that actually spells track. Ah. And it was actually to try and keep us on track. So that was what we Trust, tried to respect. do. respect. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> can I? Yes. Can definitely. I just add one one more dimension that I think is it was a critical kind of part of of our journey as well. I think sometimes having external support can unlock that as well. And I think we found a certain kind of flow when we started working with a design supporter, guide, facilitator for for some of the reasons Margie kind of said, you know, it didn't remove the need for us to do the acknowledgement of some of these parts of our process and our interactions. But when an external perspective can come in and in some cases synthesize the things that were not be, being missed maybe in some of our language, and, and I think really important, design is a powerful visual vocabulary. Visualizing something changes so much of what we think we've said, words can't always communicate what we need or what we mean. And when we brought in this design capability and capacity, things flowed. I mean, we used this word often in that process. There was flow, there was co-creation, there was co-development within our group, there was movement happening in the kind of outputs. And I think that really helped, at least in that particular part of our process, to unlock, I think, all of our contributions in a way that we're, we're stuck in some parts of the earlier processes. It didn't change that we still had to acknowledge these things and work towards them, but it helped. And I think that was a really critical um, part. So I think like a message is, it is important to bring in external yeah. pers perspectives and support sometime in a particular dynamic. Let's take just one more question and then we'll have to, to wrap up. Is there anyone else with a burning question in the room? Yes. Hi, good morning. I just want to thank all the teams for the amazing work you're doing. And can Sarah, you tell us your name? Yeah, I'm Sarah Elwell. I'm from the AFT. And as I was listening to the presentations, like joy and belong, I, st I keep going back to those, right? Like those are at the center. They're the work as well as the content, right? As well as the instructional strategies. So my question for the teams as you like dug into this it's so tempting in education once something is centered and focused on to all of a sudden make a checklist. And then it becomes like less authentic, yeah. right? And you're measuring it, but you want to still keep like the heart and, and, and the original intention behind it there at the center. So how did you all like talk about that or deal with that in your design process? I mean, and take a couple of quick responses. Fernanda, uh, online, yes, we would love to. Yeah, I just want, I love that question. Um, and I think that's an ongoing process, right? It's as we're bringing this into different communities, it's not saying this is a, a script for what you need to do. It's putting the, at least in our team, one of the ways that we talked about is to say, look, we just want to give you the science and some of the background, but you're going to have to adapt and use your genius to bring this to life and, and make it yours and, and bring it to, to your students and your community in the way that it really, really works for you. Um, with, like Roberta was saying, with deep trust, and Kathy was saying, deep trust in, in educators to know their genius and to make space to just know the kids that are with them and to create that sense of connection. So I just wanted to Definitely. both acknowledge the, the, uh, the how much I love your question and to um, also just hold in this whole space this acknowledgement of teachers as amazing human beings and giving them space to center their own humanity and their genius in the work that they're doing and saying it's about that relationship. If you look at the video with Pam Cantor, uh, any of the videos that we have with Pam Cantor or David Yeager, it's really about sort of putting a spotlight on that connection, the love between a teacher and a student, and that's the magic. And to say, yeah. when you know that that's happening, when you feel it, that's when it's working. And it's not about a script or a checklist. It's about making space for the love. Wonderful. And Michelle, thank you. Yes, Michelle. one quick, and then we'll have to cut. Sure. Yeah. Um, I just want to say Andrea and I kind of had an opportunity this week. Um, we started a study about uh, involving the Joy Kit 
and um, some of the science that we learned about a, a joy and talk and play and learning. And how do we keep it alive? It was wonderful to watch families inter interacting with um, the materials and the, the things that we prepared. And um, just that kept it alive for us. And then for us to sit back and hopefully we'll be able to tell a, a little bit more about it in a minute. But Andrea, from her perspective with science and, and having that focus, and my focus is always it just was amazing to see the reciprocal joy between parent and child, adult and child, as they were doing it. Um, and for me, that is the work, you know, and that, yeah. you know, it's wonderful to know that our their brains even do sync in that way when they talk and play together. But to see the um, outer uh, manifestation of that was amazing. So that, that keeps it alive for us, I think. That's awesome. That's a, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, we, oh, you need a mic real quick, Natasha. Yeah, just one thing with the kit. I mean, it's a very small thing, but part of our design process was to kind of embed invitations to those who were using the kit to um, create things of their own. So we have activity cards, but in each um, thematic segment, we have blank cards that invite people to create their own joy activities. We have um, activities that involve things like writing a postcard, and we have blank postcards, or you know, being able to cut the cards and build, you know, just um, whatever you can come up with as part of that. So we, you know, kind of embedded that invitation to, you know, tangibly uh, work with that as well. And in the breakouts, you get to see those cards. Um, so Kathy's going to close I, us I out. I only have we'll one more comment here, but I think what is underscored in what you all just said and an answer maybe to the question, is that not all things that are super important that should happen in a school and happens in teaching are measurable on standardized tests. And I think our tendency to always say that we have to go to what's measurable in a standardized test has really taken us astray. And that's why I say again, we need to go back to human relationships, to joy, belonging, understanding diversity, and we need to understand that these are the pillars on which all education is born. So I hope we can give education back to the educators. Yes, and much good food for thought for our conversations this afternoon, too. So thank you. So we're going to, we'll, we'll, we'll dismiss the room. We'll go to the breakout sessions up here on screen. You'll see um, where to go. At the 25 minute mark, we'll come around and say, switch. And everyone will move, and you can go to another room and learn about the, the projects in the other rooms. Um, and this is our main event space. The rooms here are in other parts of New America's office space. And we'll have people who can help you get there. And for those online, come back at 1, because we have an incredible keynote for you. Thank you.